Hello and welcome to another episode of the Manhood Simplified podcast, where once again, we're going to make what I call really an attempt at understanding what it means to be a man in this country and what masculinity ought to look like in order for us to build the kind of world we'd envisioned. Today, we're hoping to hone in on issues around sexual assault, what it means to be a male survivor, and what healing perhaps needs to take place amongst men if we are to get to the bottom of solving issues to do with masculinity. Always great to be with you. Amanda Nyati. And my name is Gameli Shepovana. Yes, it is a very beautiful name. I am well aware of that. And helping us to rewrite this page of the Manual of Manhood, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our guests. First, Mr. Martin Pelders, author, or, or should I say the um, head honcho of Matrix Men South Africa, as well as Dr. Malosi Langa, author of the book Becoming Men. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Please take a moment, if you would, to briefly introduce yourselves and the work that you do. Thank you. My name is Martin Pelders. I'm the founder of Matrix Men, life coach, recovery coach, and uh, yeah, just a man who raises awareness about uh, sexually abused men. I'm Malusi Langa, an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Wits University and a senior researcher Center for Study of Violence and Reconciliation. And I'm doing a lot of research around meanings of like you know, boyhood, manhood in South Africa. And perhaps that's a great place to start, shall we? I mean, we've been struggling to even define what manhood actually looks like. You spend your days, I guess, worming through that question. If you were to be asked that question, I mean, what does it mean to be a man and a boy, perhaps in the South African context? What's your response? Thanks, Ayanda. Um, and normally, you know, when I ask men or boys, you know, to say, what does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be a, a man? The first answer that I normally get is that of a giggle. Right. Um, and a giggle which I guess it highlights like you know, something that you're asking me an obvious question. A question that I've not made time to think it through. And, and often, you know, some will even go far as sort of like you know, standing up and, and saying, are you, are, you, are you serious? Are you serious that you're asking me what does it mean to be, to be a boy, to be a man? And I guess for me, that bodily reaction, it is, it is quite telling mm. that it is, it is not easy for boys and men to define what it means to be a boy or a man. But then when I try and analyze that, is that no one is born a man, no one is born a woman. And the process of becoming a man in the process of becoming a boy, like I've said in my book, it, it is something that is quite, is quite like no violent, and I'll explain more in details at a later stage. Right. But basically the simple definition is that they, 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 there's a social construct of what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a man. And, and it's how boys and men are expected to sort of like no behave. And that process of the expectation that one has to be in this way, one has to behave in this way, it, it alienates boys and men from their own like, you know, humanity. So basically the simple definition of boyhood, manhood, is what the society is expecting of you, that you need to behave in this way. You need to be strong, you need to be tough, you need to be this, you need to be this, you need to be this. And once you are not behaving in that way, your manhood, your boyhood becomes like no question. As far as our inability to sing on the same hymn sheet, as far as this definition of boyhood and manhood and how we understand those two things to be, is this part and parcel of the problem in society where so many differing definitions and understandings of the terms are clashing with each other and no one seems to be able to make up their mind on that? And how does that further uh, make the landscape even more foggy as far as trying to understand this? Martin, I think you can also... Um, Toss your opinion in on this one as well. Yeah, I think that you know, there's a huge focus on 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 boys and men. But I was just as we're talking, I'm thinking, but there's there's you know, people get offended when we talk about po toxic masculinity, right? I mean, a lot of men get really angry with you. Close off, in fact. Yeah, they close off, and it's like you're attacking masculinity, and no, we're not. We're actually trying to 
eliminate the toxicity of masculinity, the fact that you need to use aggression to solve your problems, that you can go and drown your, your sorrows in, in alcohol and all that sort of stuff. But we're always genderizing everything because I'm thinking now that I'm, I'm sitting and thinking about this, this toxic femininity as well. You know, where all women are, are nurturing, all women are caring and loving, and they're not. They're quite simply not. Some women just don't want to have children, but society pressurizes them into having children. Or they don't want to get married, but society pressurizes them. So I think the problem is societal precepts. And we kind of need to start looking at those and say, listen, you know, why can't we just let people develop as they develop? Right. You know, I mean, I'm looking at my young nephew and my son, who's now a year and a half, and you don't need to, you know, my son is like a rugby player, and nobody's taught him that. You know, I mean, he, he, he hits into the, his high chair and, and starts pushing it across the house. You know, he does that, whereas my daughter was totally different. You know, I don't need to teach him to be an aggressive young boy. He just has that natural strength, that natural drive to, to be masculine. You know, and we need to stop forcing our opinions and our ideals on on children, we need to just let them develop as they develop, and they will just turn out to what they're supposed to develop into. I believe. Yeah, Doctor Lang, I see you. You thinking deeply yeah. about. No, I this. mean, obviously, I mean, going back to 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 the question, and hence, once upon a time, you know, I guess the the term like no masculinity was sort of like no used, uh, and and sort of like no defined, but as we went along, it was like, look, I mean, it, 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 is, it, is, it is quite inhibiting. Uh, because when you say masculinity, basically it's like you know, something quite singular, okay? And hence then it was like you no know, agreed, I guess, in, in the literature, you know, say masculinities. And with the use of like you no know, masculinities is that the different ways of being a boy, the different ways of being a man. And, and, and obviously this will, will differ in terms of class, race, age, the context, and many other sort of like no factors. But, 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 but also with that, it, it was an acknowledgement that the, the notion of like no manhood, it is, it is quite unstable. The, the notion of like no boyhood, it is, it is quite um, fluid. It, it moves, it changes, and, and hence it becomes like no quite, quite messy, mm. like you know, in, in a way. Mm. But also that has offered us like a rich, a rich, a rich tool uh, that one man can be like, you know, many things. Uh, you, you can be like, like a good football player. Uh, you, you could be like a bad lover. You could, you could be a good cooker. You could, you could be like, you know, so many things. But, but, but also here it's about how then do you reconcile, I guess, like, you know, some of this, like, you no know, tensions. Mm. In your in your sense of like no sort of like no manhood, which is a good way to to segue into what else I was hoping to unpack. I mean, if men can occupy these different positionalities, it should be easy for us to think of men as being survivors of sexual violence, right? I mean, surely they, that exists somewhere on the spectrum. Reality, though, is that stereotypically speaking, that isn't wrapped around the head. Dare I even say? of sometimes even male survivors themselves mm. because of the, sexual, the, the socialization, I should say, that we've all been the recipients of. I mean, is that strange to you? Does that, is that something that you've noted, something that's come up in your work? Totally. I mean, let's look at some famous male survivors of sexual abuse, right? Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Mike Tyson, right? Tyler Perry. Mm. I mean, when you look at these people in, 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 in the terms of masculinity, our precepts of masculinity, you're going to look at them and say, well, these are men's men, you know? I mean, if you look at somebody like The Rock, who's a bigger man? The Rock, I mean, not in terms of size, but I mean in terms of character. Or the man who, um, and his name eludes me now, I've been trying to think of it all the time. Who Terry broke? Cruz? No, the guy that, the, the, the ultra-distance runner who broke the... Uh, you know, he ran the the mile, uh, the the marathon in 21 minutes or something like that. So, oh, okay. What's it, I mean, you look at the Rock, who's a giant of a man, and then you look at this guy, who's who's, who's short. He's like five foot five, yet he runs at an average speed of like 21 kilometers an hour. I mean, I can't even cycle that fast. You know what I mean? And so, who's 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 the stronger man? The Rock, who bench presses like my body weight or, or more, and or this guy. You know, so we, we need to change those kids. So, you know, in terms of 
male victims of sexual abuse. I mean, you look at those three names that I've just mentioned, and these are all perceived to be men's men. Mm -hmm. You know, and how long did it take them to finally come out and talk about the fact that they were sexually abused? They were all well into their thirties, forties, even fifties in terms of you know, Sugar Ellen. It was in his fifties. He was retired from boxing before he started talking about what happened to him. Uh, we've just had uh, the Manchester, the ex-Manchester player um, again. Uh, names elude me. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll find them in we'll the yes. yeah. edits. Yeah, you know, it's um, he's just come out. Patrice. Patrice Evra. Evra, that's right. He's just come out. He's also a survivor of sexual abuse. Why do you think it takes so long? I mean, uh, because I, I imagine this is what you're getting at, right? They, they, there's something that prevents these men. Society. Right. Society doesn't give men permission to talk about it. You know, we, we currently focused on, on, on female victims we, when we talk GBV. I mean, it's gender, which is a, is a neutral term for male and female mm -hmm. these days. 260 odd different genders, right? So it's a neutral term, but the minute you put based violence behind it, it changes the, the meaning of the word for 99% of the population. Suddenly we're talking about women, we're talking about girls. We're not talking about gender, we're not talking about everybody. Um, we were chatting before uh, we started that when you walk into a rape crisis center, guarantee you 99.999% of all the posters on the wall are going to depict a male perpetrator and a female victim. You know, and when I walked into a rape crisis center as a 16-year-old boy, looking to talk about, finally plucked up the courage to talk about it, that very picture turned me off and I ran away. And then I went and poured myself into alcohol, sex, drugs, what for the next 30 years of my life, before I heard other men talking about it. And that gave me permission to start my healing process. Just to latch onto that, Martin, I think what oh, I'd like to I'd like to posit the the question of whether or not an a lack of access to the vocab and lack and access to the kind of language you need to find to be able to communicate these instances of being sexually abused, um, like you just referred to. I wonder if that could also be one of the issues that plague men from speaking out um, in these instances. What would you say are the difficulties that men face as far as accessing this style, accessing this 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 um, this vocabulary, Space, this language, and, yeah. this, and and how do we go about undoing all of that? Well, it starts with with children. It starts with parents. You know, I mean, I sit down and I do this often. I I, I go to men and I say, give me words for emotions, and the average that men come up with is about seven or eight words. I sit down with women and I say, give me words for different words for emotions. Ah, oh, man. A week later, they'll still be busy rattling off different things, you know. And when they see me in a month's time, they'll go, oh, and I thought about this, this, or this, or this, or this. So men, I always say men have been given five tools to cope with trauma in their lives, right? Uh, aggression or violence, right? Sex, right? Alcohol, drugs, or pornography. I mean, that's kind of, that's it, you know. Um, we're not given the emotional vocab, Right? to be able to talk about what's happening, how we're feeling. We're not taught these things. In fact, when a little boy falls down, scrapes his knee and his blood pouring over his knee, and all he wants is a little comfort and empathy from his parents, what's he told? Ah, oh, don't be such a baby, you know? Big boys don't cry, you know? You're such a girl, you know, things like that. So why are we treating our children differently? Like I say, I come back to the example of my son he can't even speak it, yet he's like pushing high chairs around the house, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's just, he's a boy, and he's totally different to my daughter. She's a girl. She likes to sit there and play with dolls, and, you know, my boy has the same access to dolls. He doesn't want to play with them. He wants to play with trucks. He wants to bench press things. Right. He wants to break windows. <laughs> and, I, I, I do know. wonder whether your response to your kids would have been different had the roles been around. I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to hypothesize, right? Because mm. we're in a context where it just so happens, I guess, where people are most likely not to frown at your son because, you know, that, that's, that's our thinking around what boys should be getting up to. But it does bring us, uh, Dr. Langer, back into the question about what becoming men actually looks like. And, you know, the journey that is typically followed in, in getting to that place. I wonder though, whether we could speak about, let's say, decoding toxic masculinity mm. without taking in what misogyny looks like, right? Without actually speaking about whether or not 
we are being honest about ways through which even men in the spaces that we frequent mm. still espouse misogynistic characteristic, misogynistic sentiment. Mm. I mean, obviously, there's the, the something about, like, you know, masculinity, you know, say it's relational in, in, in character. And where we need to decode it is for it to exist independently. When I say relational, it, it means it, it always compares, compares itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it can't exist on its own. Mm -hmm. And and then it, it says something about where even in the in the pursuit of like manhood, you never sort of like arrive. It's it's an illusion. It becomes it's unattainable goal. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this and then do you, you think like you have arrived. What you've done today is not good enough for tomorrow. Tomorrow you still need to perform and perform and perform and perform. But if it, and, and the only real, real, real way for it to be decoded is, is to get to a point where I, I no longer need to like, you know, aspire, OK? And, and, and there is like an internal, so, so obviously you revert back to the self. But when you revert back to the self, the whole society is looking at you. You know, because once upon a time you're being told, you know, say, like Martin is saying, uh, be be quite expressive, okay? And and there's been that like no talk, and then it's like okay, we need to find like a label, a label like around, yeah, metrosexual sort of like no man. Mm. Of, of course, it 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 comes with like no some costs, you know, ways like okay, we we don't want men that are dead like emotionally, and then you start like no expressing, and then it's like no, you're expressing too much, mm. okay? and hold sort of like your, your, your horses. And then you're pushed to be sort of like in the middle. And then when, when you're in the middle, obviously there's always this sort of like no conflict. And the part that I want to bring in is like around, there's no way we can liberate like no men without liberating like no women. Meaning all of us need to be liberated. You, you know, because in my, private space where I do a lot of psychotherapy work, I, I hear a lot of men saying, look, I mean, I'm trying my level best uh, to be like a good man. And I'm saying good man with inverted sort of like no commas. But in my attempt to be like a good man, a good father, to be present for my, for my child, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being told to say, you need to be out there and be with like no other guys. But when I'm out there, it's like you're not spending time with, 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 with your child. Mm -hmm. You know, all these like, you know, contradictions, they get to a point where men say, I don't know. I don't know what is that I need to do, you know, to sort of like you know, arrive. Mm. Um, and it, it comes with like, you know, such an emotional, emotional pain, mm. you know, to a point where I'm saying a lot gets said, you know, to say men need to change. And then I'm like, OK, do, 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 do we need to develop a sort of like a list, a list of what does this like you no know, change like you know, entail, mm. or, or a scale of like, change to yeah. determine how much change yeah. they'd like to see. Yeah. As men make. Like, and, and and of course, immediately when you do that, where and and you see it, you will see it in a lot of lot of books. You know, to say uh, these are the key characteristics of what it means to be like a good man. Okay, but you always wonder about are this really really attainable. And whose standard is this? Mm. Uh, can this standard be applicable, you know, to to all men, irrespective of class, irrespective of race, irrespective of gender, and irrespective of, I guess, even the location where they sort of like no live. Mm. I'm I'm curious as far as everything that you've had to say about men trying their level best, and trying their level best in, in, in a climate where none of their efforts seem to be good enough. I, I, I want to I find, find out your insight, both of your insight, uh, on, on the matter of what the, what, the, what the women we're meant to be protecting, what the women we're meant to be nurturing and honoring, the role they have to play in the confusion and the mess that we've referred to earlier. You mentioned um, the instances where 
where men feel like they're trying hard in this sector, but in doing so, they sacrifice trying hard in another sector. And mm. this question of what does, I'm, I'm thinking about things like uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, what mm. does and what doesn't constitute sexual assault, and how the conversation that women have on that matter and the contradictory me messages that they offer to that serve to further enhance the messiness of the, of the situation. What role do they have to play in causing this, um, this mess? And how do we go about exactly and clarify, clarifying exactly what is and what isn't inappro inappropriate behavior towards um, those of the fairer sex, quote unquote? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'll, I'll, I'll rely on, on my, like my experience having served in a lot of cases like around like no sexual harassment mm -hmm. where it, and, and, and I guess without even disclosing like no details of some of some of the, the cases where and, and, and here I'll talk about like no students sort of like no mainly you know because I'm based at the university and then it would be like okay there's this like an event as, as we're sitting here and, and chit chatting and chit chatting and of course there are comments that get like no made okay, uh, pass me a, a coffee, uh, you this and this and this, okay? It, the, the comment is made in that like no context. And in fact, there's, there's also sort of like laughter, okay? And someone, uh, I guess, put your hand, like, you know, somewhere where the other may felt that the hand was put, like, you know, inappropriately, okay? And then later and later, allegations then begin to sort of like arise. And I remember this case in particular where, 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 where the student who was like a male student said, but comrade, this is how we always sort of like spoke, okay? You know, to say in this like no space, uh, sort of like anything was allowed to be said, mm -hmm. okay? And, 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 and a lot of examples were sort of like given, okay? And then when I heard what, what was being said, I did feel, as an outsider, I did feel that that was inappropriate. But when we called, I guess, like, you know, sort of like you know, witnesses, you know, to say, can you confirm the language? You know, to say, this is the language that is being used, like, you know, in the space. A lot of witnesses, like, you know, confirm, do not say, that's how we normally sort of like, you know, talk, okay? And then for me, and then I begin to sort of like, you know, question, do not to say, can we be consistent? Mm. You know, to say, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we are sitting here. Uh, we need to call that out. You know, to say, you can't. And if you can't, you can't. It can't be said, you know, at this moment it is appropriate. At this moment it is not appropriate. Mm. Because then it, it creates a confusion. It, 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 it does. Mm. That even when we talk about, uh, you know, sort of like you no know, GBV, uh, sexual harassment, we sit on our couches, be at eight o'clock, okay? And we watch a lot of like no soapies, okay? And when we watch them, it's sort of like our guards at that time, they have to be down. Everything is more acceptable. We can watch Generation, we can watch Isabai, and you can watch all these like no soapies. But there are a lot of problematic like no discourses mm -hmm. that get perpetuated, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But at that time, no one will say anything. Until something sort of like no happens, we are all carrying like no plac placards, hashtag this, hashtag this, hashtag this. But I'm saying we've been quite complicit yeah. in a lot of like no instances and instances which have been, which we should have been like no very like no consistent. And I think that would be my like no contribution to say we need to be consistent and sure. be consistent. Yeah, it's fascinating what you're saying. I don't know if you want to chime in there. Um, you know, there's something you're talking about. Universities and harassment, and I, and I just thought of a study by the CDC in, in, in the USA. They went to 12 uh, colleges in the USA, and, and, and colleges are perceived to be these spaces where girls are raped and boys are just sexually harassing them and everything. And they went to 12 colleges, and, and the, the comeback from that is the majority of boys in all but two of the colleges were victimized. Yeah. In what sense? Sexually harassed or raped. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the weird thing, but we don't want to, you know, society sold us, you know, but we're we're sexual beings, men are sexual beings, and that, you know, if we have sex, no matter what the circumstance, we're supposed to be happy. 
So when your 40-year-old math teacher rapes a little 12-year-old boy, well, he's lucky. You know, he's, he's, he's scored. You know, wow, he's such a man. Right. You know, but the fact of the matter is that 12-year-old boy was not ready for that interaction. And in fact, research has told us in South Africa in particular that the majority of boys uh, are raped by women and not men. So it's, it's, it's quite sad that we only focus in, we, we, we're turning this into a gender issue right. when it's a human problem, you know? And then if we look at boys and we go back to, boys are a product of how they are raised, right? So what you see and what you experience most in your lifetime is what you're going to emulate or become, right? Like you say, we're not given the opportunity to, 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 to flourish and become who we are supposed to be. Society conforms us into a specific channel, right? So we look at the thing as like, I was told that when I'm 25, I'm going to buy a house and, I, well, I'm going to get married, buy a house, have two cars, a dog and two children, and then I'm going to be happy. The fact of the matter is I had all of that and I was deeply unhappy. I woke up every day wanting to kill myself, right? I woke up every morning going, I wish I was dead. Right. So what's the point? I suffered major depression and that's a product of my upbringing, right? Yeah. I am a product of what happened to me as a child. So we need to start changing these things. We need to stop trying to enforce what we perceive to be masculinity or femininity on children and just let them develop in, yeah. into who they're supposed to be. Your lived experience is, I guess, drawing into sharp focus, questions around how men, given our socializations, respond to trauma. And I wonder whether or not we've come any close to being able to, at the very least, understand that and place its contribution to what we now commonly refer to as toxic masculinity. Let me begin with you, Martin. I mean, because you've spoken a lot about your, your own personal experience. At the time when you were grappling with these difficulties, did you feel equipped to? No, definitely not. Yeah. No, definitely not. And where do the gaps lie, I guess, becomes the, the secondary question. Well, you know, I mean, it, it just becomes, uh, you know, for me, I mean, I couldn't go to my home to talk about the things that were happening to me because those things were happening in my home. Right. You know, so I couldn't, I couldn't turn around to my dad and say, hey, mom's beating me, you know, because he would like, why, you know? I mean, it, it, so I d didn't have the ability to go to those closest to me to seek help. At school, because, you know, we know from research that, that boys who've suffered major trauma in their lives grow up and display the, the, the symptoms of ADHD. You know, so we're very dissociated and we're very sort of scatterbrained and all that sort of stuff. So at school, I, was, I wasn't very attentive to my schoolwork. I was called dumb. I was labeled as stupid or lazy. You know, so all of these things. So it starts right from there and goes through. Teachers don't have the knowledge to be able to point these things out. A lot of doctors don't have the experience to point these things out. I mean, I can carry on. The entire society just doesn't have the ability. I mean, a man walks into a police station and says, I've been raped. And what do you think is going to happen to him? Most of the time. Huh? Yeah, he's going to get laughed at. And they go, well, did you enjoy it? You know, he says, well, actually, I was gang raped by five men uh, anally. No, I didn't enjoy it. But he doesn't have the ability to say that. He's in shock. He's in trauma. He wants to go and, and, and do what he feels is right, yet society is not equipped to deal with it. Mm. So it's, it's a huge problem that begins in the home mm. and we need to start re-educating parents we need to start re-educating teachers we need to start re-educating doctors we need to start re i mean i can guarantee you a majority of doctors do not know that more boys are sexually abused in this country than girls guaranteed even the two research projects that glaringly state the obvious Yet we ignored it. One was presented in Parliament in 2008. It was ignored, right? Because we were looking for a link between the spread of HIV AIDS and sexual abuse, right? right? Parliament ignored it. Well, we had AIDS denialism in those days. It was like, take some garlic and have a few madumbis and it'll sort it out, right? So we all have our problems. Yet it was ignored. It is still today ignored. I mean, for years, I, I, I went from like talking about my experience to getting to a point where I said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the research that has been done. You can't argue with research, right? And 
And when I point it out and, and I say to people, but research tells us, but research tells us, eventually they get to the point, oh, are you in your research? Mm. Yeah. What else do we rely on if not that, right? We can't. I yes. mean, Dr. Langer, your response to this question around trauma and men internalizing, responding to trauma? Yeah, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> if, if you look at the history of, I'll say, PTSD, which is post-traumatic like no stress, like no disorder. Interestingly, in terms of its history, it, it, of, of course it arose out of studies that were done with like no war veterans in, in the US. And of course it becomes like a diagnostic like no criteria in 1980, but fast forward, it sort of like no changes, okay? That men will only be diagnosed with PTSD in relation to war nothing else mm. okay and i agree with martin that we we don't have much written about uh, ptsd in relation to like you no know, men as like you no know, victims and of course the issue also begins with with i guess the shame the shame the humiliation um and and and, and i guess also the sense the sense that one has lost like you no know, his his like you no know, manhood um, and then the other point that I want to make, like around men, men, men and trauma, is the fact that obviously when, 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 when it comes to, and, and I'll give you like a practical, practical example. We, we, we did a study now around house robberies, where obviously perpetrators are there, Everyone is in the house. And in fact, a lot of men who found themselves in such like no situations, none of them were willing to seek like no trauma counseling. Mm. The main worry was about the well-being, the well-being of their families, the well-being of their kids, the well-being of their like no partners. Mm. These are the victims of the burglaries, by the way. Yes. Mm. You know. And when we try to sort of like, you know, check and check and check individually, individually now, you know, and, and, and it's late, late. So, so, so obviously also there is a delayed, like, you know, reaction. Mm. You know, say, okay, now I can see everyone is like, you no know, fine. I need to find, like, you no know, my own, like, you no know, moment. So the advice that I normally give is that with men, you don't need to intervene, like, you know, immediately. It, given all the things that we've said about the construction of like no masculinity, even with police officers, uh, even with the work that I'm doing currently in Marigana, first, first responders, it, it, yeah, you know they don't. You you need to wait and wait and wait and wait, uh, and when you wait, few years later is when some are more willing, you know, to sort of like no talk. And I guess I mean we've delayed, but like you know this point, you know, to say we need to get to a point where we humanize. Like you no know, men, we we humanize like you no know, men to say, you don't need to suffer in silence. You you need to come to the fore, and once we recognize that you not you don't need to play this protective, like in you know, a role of saying, because also with uh, uh, burglaries, there's like a sense of like you know one has failed, mm -hmm. you know to to be the head of the family. You know, because like at that moment, everyone was like no helpless. Everyone was sort of like no powerless. So all the ingredients of what it means to be like a man were taken away. Like at that time, you're embarrassed, you're humiliated in the eyes of like no your kids, in the eyes of like no your, your, wife. your wife. Just to latch onto that, doctor, is male victimhood seem to be less of an issue, less important than female victimhood? And is that how our society has been has has been pre, uh, dispositioned, um, for lack of a better word? As far as I'm, I'm thinking of instances, uh, just as um, Martin was referring to earlier, where a man walks into um, or steps into a space to report. A, a yeah, the reaction is not the reaction is not the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and both for, I mean, even now, I mean, they, there's a big study that we are currently doing on SGBV. Okay. And then in the questionnaire, it's around sexual and gender-based like no violence. And then we're asking, we're asking participants, 
uh, are you aware of services uh, and what services are you aware of in your community and what are some of the reasons you're not making use of this like no services and I sort of like no insisted you know as, as, as part of trying to answer I guess like no, some of Martin like nos comments are you not going to that clinic you know because they there are no like no male doctors mm. are you not going to that clinic because there are no non-binary like you know people or people that are uh, non-gender like you no know, conforming okay and of course with a lot of men that we're interviewing many of them are saying it, it would be better it would be better if i were to go there because we know in a lot of clinics you find like a you know, female clinic female sorry female nurses okay and 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 if this is the reason that we're being like you know, given i guess at a policy level Will we get to a point where we begin to have such places being staffed with male, let's say, male nurses, male doctors, male, male psychologists, and, and so on and so forth, mm. okay? But then it talks to some of these, like, you know, professions. Because, you know, in this country, how many men train as, like, no nurses? Yeah. How many men train as? And again, it's, it's about those sort of, like, no misconceptions. Right. So for me, ultimately, is that we can go far as the Domestic like, no, Violence Act of 1998, okay? And it has been amended and amended and amended. We have so many policies. It's 2022. We are still sitting here and having this like, no, conversation. Yeah. And then it's like, when will this come to an end? I'm of the view to say we have spoken and we have spoken and we have spoken. We are rehearsing answers that we've been giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. But the problem sort of like no continues. Mm. Does that um, lend itself to the issue around having this conversation with like-minded people versus trying to have this exact same conversation with those who might not be initiated, who those, who those who might not be aware of the state of the problem that we're facing? And how do we, how do we bridge those gaps of communication? I think, I mean, obviously, I do not want to give a very long-winded uh, answer. But, I mean, there's a paper that I've written with colleagues where we, we're saying in South Africa, we know what are the causes of violence. We know them in and out. Mm. So in that paper, we argue that we have reached a cul-de-sac, you know. And, 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 and obviously, the conclusion that we reach in that paper is, is like around what we call a second wave. And obviously it was before the wave of COVID, COVID. you know, a second wave of violence sort of like yes. no scholarship. Yeah. And basically what we are saying in there is that the risk factors, we know them like no very well. And hence all policy policies get made based on risk like no factors, but not on, on, on the subject, you know, sort of like no itself. The subject itself, meaning uh, ayanda, ayanda, you know, to say, and, and obviously I'll, I'll speak like as a psychologist. Psy psychologically, what does it mean to be ayanda? Uh, and, and if then we're true, the, the, the enactment and the reenactment of what it means to be this like no subject that he is. And try and like spend time, you know, to say, ayanda, the moments where you get angry, and when you're angry as, 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 as I am, and, and I know then people then say, no, but now you're psychologizing, mm -hmm. like, you know, the problem. But I'm saying what we've been doing is very sociological, okay? It's, it's more political. It's in terms of, like, you know, factors and factors and factors. But all these factors do not dent, dent any change, dent any change in terms of, like, you know, the subject. Hence, I then went back, you know, to say, let me spend time with the same group of like no people. And I see it even with, and, and of course, there's that luxury, of course, with, yes. with my patients. Yes, control you, the farm, yeah. You know, where I'm seeing this guy, he's on one to one, he comes for the session today, he comes for next week, he comes the week after, and there are those that have been seen for three to four years. Of course, in terms of the frequency, it changes as we go along, okay? And I see where we would have like no started where now the guy, there is this appreciation. Appreciation of saying, look, the moments where the center is not holding. 
and there are moments where the center holds, there are moments where I lose temper, there are moments where I realize my own mesogony, despite the fact that I see myself as being quite like no progressive. There are moments where I catch myself making sexist, sexist jokes. There are moments, and, and then the subject continues to soft like no reflect. It is not a moment of saying, we are now marching to union building. Mm -hmm. And then for that moment, I have this like you no know, awareness. Mm -hmm. And then there's no Tsukhufatsu Pule who has been killed. Right. And then we all go back to our laurels. Mm -hmm. And then we are waiting for another major what I call a, pub, a public spectacle, mm, right. you know, sort of like my right. mind. And we're speaking now in a context where the news cycle is not necessarily talking about gender-based violence or anything like that. And I wonder whether or not, for instance, dare I even say, broadcasters would make space for something like this outside of that outrage, as it were. Because sometimes that's where the criticism lies. We go through these iterations of anger, um, perhaps your guys' calls, phones are ringing off the hook, producers wanting you on their shows. And when it dies, we, we, we sort of move on, you know? It's over. Right. Mm, and, yeah. and perhaps that's, that's kind of where we need to begin if we want to move the conversation forward, right? How do we keep, at the very least, the interest alive? Because the problems don't go away just because it's no longer on the news, just because it's no longer on the front pages. Just because um, it's no longer on priority. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We need to, I mean, let's not talk about the press because they're probably the most guilty of the entire bunch, right? Because the minute there's, there's an, an abusive uh, act against a woman, boy, the press is on its front page news, it's on every news station, it's everywhere, and it carries on, you know? Um, I, I'm busy dealing with a case in, 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 in Peter Maritzburg where there was a, 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 a pedophile who uh, he, he posed as a, as a school counselor. He was, in fact, he was a, a, a psychologist who, who worked as a school counselor had access to these boys, and we know that he raped nine boys repeatedly over several years, okay? Probably more, we don't know about. You know, the, the press coverage of that particular case, I mean, you'd think, here's a serial rapist, child rapist, who got off on 500 rand bail, okay? Was only covered by the local newspaper in Maritzburg. How sad, and as much as I try to draw attention to all the major newspapers in the country weren't interested, mm -hmm. you know? We had to have, like, a Parktown Boys, you know? Suddenly, wow, major thing, you know, Parktown Boys. Uh, now we're suddenly talking about it. And because of the exposure on that Parktown Boys cases were handled within a year, right? Marisburg case, six years. Mm -hmm. Six years, we finally got judgment, and we have to wait another four months till July to get sentencing. And the guy, he's guilty, but he's allowed to walk free. It just doesn't make sense to me. So we, as activists, need the press to buy into this. We, as activists, need the press to tell our stories. You know, I mean, my organization has just run a thing called the Nkunzi Project. And we've featured 10 men who've told their stories about being raped as children or um, being abused, et cetera, et cetera. We had over a million people view those stories, you know? This to me is sort of an interest story that the press should be picking up on and putting that, because when one man tells his story, he gives another man permission to start talking about it. And I can tell you something that the lives that have been transformed through this are, are incredible. Right. I mean, I've watched men physically change, not just mentally change, physically change before my eyes in a year long program that we run. I mean, that is worth it, you know? And if we could get more men into this, then we can be ch changing individuals, you know? But we need to be running the same programs for parents, teaching them how to parent. We need to be running the same programs for teachers so that they can be empathetic to victims that they spot, obviously spot in their classes, you know? You mentioned something very interesting in that, which ties into something that you mentioned at the, near the top of our discussion, as far as how um, these issues seem to be focused squarely or should I say more so on women than the men who are also equal, equally impacted by these issues of, of sexual violence, sexual assault and, and rape and, and, and the like. And how that discrepancy between the volume at which women report these issues versus the volume at which men report these issues is informed by little instances like um, what you mentioned about what you saw in the clinic when you walked in and the various ways in which men are discouraged 
to 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 share their stories. A lot of a, a, a component of that that I found is down to whenever things like stats and and research is brought up about how men and boys are impacted by these issues. The, a lot of the response to that becomes, oh no, but we're talking about the women now. Yes. If the men and women are going through this, they must talk about that by themselves. Is, is that symptomatic of, of an issue that's being faced? Um, where again, it, it ties back to a question I think I posed earlier, where men and boys' victimhood is viewed to be less important than exactly. women's uh, victimhood. And how do we go about addressing that to open a space where everyone, regardless of which side of the gender divide they're on, are able to share the stories that they need to share? Well, I think we need to start changing perceptions. How do we start changing? I, mean, I was talking to Yaranda earlier where I said to him, do a quick Google search on images uh, about gender-based violence, images about sexual violence or sexual abuse. When you look at those images, I can guarantee you 100% of them will be about girls, the pictures, just the, so the, the, the image that we portray to society is that it's only girls, you know? And I always call them the hairy fist poster. So you'll see the hairy fist in the front and the girl cowering or the woman cowering with the blue eye and that sort of stuff. Pushing this message that only women are victims and only men are perpetrators. When we know and we're starting to find out more and more that this isn't true, right? Research is starting to emerge from the UK, from Australia, from uh, America that, in fact, between 40 and 52% of men are violently being abused in their homes, you know? So that means there are female perpetrators. But, you know, again, society tells us that women are all nurturing and loving and caring. You know, we all love our, our, our children, mm -hmm. and, you know? It, not true. You know, we are just portraying the wrong images. We are, we're, we're talking about the wrong things. We're making it a gender issue when it's a human problem. You know what I mean? Why is it that if a boy grows up in a physically violent home, that he's the one that grows up to be the perpetrator, yet his sister is going to be like a wonderful, virtuous human, virtuous being, human being who's not angry at the world, you know? <laughs> She's also going to be angry. She would also probably start displaying signs or traits of violence against those closest to her. Right. And this is the, the insidious nature of abuse, is that it actually impacts on those that you love the most. I mean, I have the men come in and talk to me and they're always saying this, why am I always angry with those that I love the most? Mm. I always hurt the ones I love the most, the ones that are closest to me. And they, they hate it. I mean, they just don't want to be who they are. They just don't understand why they like that. Mm. So how do we change this? We need to start changing the way that we portray abuse. Right. That, you know, and gender-based violence and all that sort of stuff. Gotcha. We, we need to somehow find a way of rounding our conversation down. But perhaps as we do that, um, Dr. Langer, how do we get to a point where the binary of good and bad isn't so stark when we think about who the victims and perpetrators are? Because if Martin's own experience, your work is anything to go by, we, we know it's not that simple even for the most atrocious of perpetrators, you know, people who many would say lock them up and throw away the key. Somewhere in there lies a victim of some other system, mm. you know? Um, and I wonder whether the Academy yeah, of that's, Research... That's, that's what we call the polymorphy or the polymorphous nature of like no violence. Mm. And, and, and I guess I'm, I've gone back to the paper, you know, to say, I think we have tried to distinguish like you no know, different forms of like no violence as if they can be differentiated. In fact, they overlap, and hence we say they're polymorphous. They, they can't be differentiated. But the, 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 the way out, I guess, like, you know, for me, because obviously at, at some point in this conversation, we're like, look, the media and this and this and this, the headline, and things sort of, like, you know, disappear. I'm not a very social media, like, you no know, person, but I was talking to a colleague uh, Professor Kopanoratel, and and he said, "Look, Malus, we have no choice. I know you're very busy, but when time allows, let, let's also invade this like no spaces. If there's a podcast that is being made, and when time allows, make make time, go and deliver like a, a, a brief sort of like no message. And of course." Obviously, this podcast is going to be seen, I suspect, by a lot of people. And heard by more. And heard by a lot of people. 
and and it's, it is through that where now and then you get a call from like no someone say hey i saw this like no podcast like no somewhere and i saw so and so speaking about this are you able to be of any help like not to me okay so so obviously i mean there's a role uh, that conversations such as this uh, can sort of like no play and i and i've seen the positive role that conversation of this like no nature sort of like no play but my last parting shot is that all of us have a duty all of us have a duty to make change that we all wish to see we, we all have a duty as we're sitting here it is not only the four of us in this like no studio there will be people that will be editing this there will be the people that are taking like you know pictures there's my sister there in a way if if you to calculate how many are we in this like no room we are about like 12 but people that are good in numbers is that out of 12 people it means we are like 100 and like you no know, 20 and then you can imagine 120 out of this like no conversation how many people are able to sort of like not reach through this i believe that we are going to touch so many like no people so for me it is it is an honor to, to have been invited i mean to be part of this like no panel melissa the, the... There's a lot of talk, even mostly, I guess, in, in predominantly black communities about the effectiveness or lack thereof of something like counseling therapy. You work in that space, um, and I imagine it's a far-gone conclusion that you find it very effective. The reality, though, is that isn't a sentiment that resonates with a lot of people. Uh, and so in that world, I mean, how do we begin creating spaces, avenues, channels, for people to reap the benefits of something like therapy without necessarily sitting in front of a therapist? Yeah, look, um, I mean, first of all, we, we, we need to acknowledge we, we come a long way, uh, a long, long way, that in my private work, if I were to, I mean, I've been doing this work since 2002. Comparatively, if I count like you know how many male patients i've seen you know during that like no period in my early phases of my career it would be very very few very few men and then fast forward and then i say from 2015 till to date the number has has grown like you no know, substantially and here i'm talking about like you no know, black black men has grown like you no know, substantially and, and of course, that can be attributed to the, the awareness, but we still need to grow the number. Mm -hmm. The number we still need to grow. So we, we, have, had, we have had cases like around like, you know, mental health, like you know, mental health, and normally it would be a, as a result of, I guess, like you know, well-known individuals having like, you know, committed like, you know, suicide. And I know immediately after that, one is going to be inundated with a lot of calls, a lot of, can you comment on this? Can you comment on this? And again, there'll be this, like, no talk about, like, no mental health and mental health. And of course, men respond, you know, to that, like, no call, to say, I don't, I no longer need to keep quiet. But then the question remains, where do I go? Okay? So there are a lot of men that wish, as a result of the awareness that you're raising, this podcast is going to raise awareness. At the end of it, people need to know. We'll talk about like no healing. And someone will say, okay, where do, where do I go? The fact is that there are no services like no out there. Public services, it means if you need to go and see a psychologist, you need to go to Barra. But also to go to Barra, I mean, there's a red tape. You need to go to the clinic first. You need and as a result of that, already it's like, I mean, I don't have to go through that, like my pain of having to negotiate, like not so much, like my red, red tape. So for me, it's, it's, it's a challenge that we need. I, I think the point that I want to make is that awareness is slowly growing, mm. but we need to grow it more. Yes, but true. once it has been grown, where do people go? Mm. Because the fact is that 
a lot of psychologists are working in private practice. Mm. And for you to access such a service, you need to have a medical aid. Given the high rate of unemployment, how many men are going to afford that? So the least that we need to do, the least that we need to do, okay? I was in deep slot last week, and it was prior the whole uh, Dudula operation, like, you know, like no movement. I've been doing a lot of work with like no young men, of course, through soccer, okay? So what I've realized is that a lot of young men, the only way to catch them is to go to spaces where they are. Mm. So they play soccer, we go there, it's a tournament, but also then I meet with coaches because I'll not be there like at all the time. I meet with the coaches, you know, to say, hey coach, do you know what is ADHD? And then I do workshops on uh, ADHD. I do workshops on trauma that Martin spoke about. You as a soccer coach, if you, if you see a child behaving in this way, behaving in this way, you need to find ways of sitting down with this like my child. And then if you're struggling, then you can call me. That's the least that you can do. Mm. And we have people that are willing to provide such community interventions. But of course, they need resources as well. They need the resources. I need a space because now it's no longer like no one boy who wants to see me. Even with the notes that I take, where do I put them? Mm. Confidentiality, where do I write up all these like, notes? Again, for me, it's about like no commitment. You know, because I go there, it's not like, you know, someone is paying me to do that. It's, it's a commitment that I've made to myself, you know, to say, this is the least that I'm able to do. Then you can imagine if all of us were to be committed, you know, to say, as I am, I'll adopt three or four boys that I know. That I know, that now and then I'll check on them, and I'll, I'll keep on checking on them, and if then they present with something that I'm not able to, like an assist, I can call on my loss. And it's where we make use of like no networks. Like my loss look at this chap, and I see so many people on pro bono. At this chap is in crisis. Are you able to solve like an assist? And I have also other networks that I rely on. So in brief, yeah. Now, Sorry. Doctor, you mentioned healing. And I'm going to latch on to that because that segue is leaping to the question I'd like to pose to the both of you, where it seems to be we, we agree on how essential it is to pursue healing. And we also seem to be in agreement that there are not enough channels available for the men in particular in need of this healing to access this healing. So just to, just to expound on this theme of healing, I think for you, Martin, I'd like for you to, to talk us through being that you had to uh, heal from something traumatic in your own life and your own life experience, could you talk us through what healing as an idea and what that healing looked and felt like for you? Mm. And I guess for you, Doctor, being that you, you work mm. with uh, various men that, 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 that talk through all sorts of um, issues with you as far as their own experience is concerned, in you trying to help them find this healing, what does healing look like for men and how does that how does that clash with how healing is supposed to feel and resonate to those of to those in pursuit of it well from my perspective healing went from uh wanting to die most of the time five suicide attempts before i was 24 25 um to a point where I could walk in and occupy a space. I'm confident in who I am. I'm confident in my masculinity. I'm confident as a husband. I'm confident as a father. I'm confident as an activist. I'm confident as a person. I'm comfortable in my own skin for the first time. And that only happened in my 40s. You know, I started dealing with this when I was 45. It took me two to three years of intensive work. Um, and then in 2011, I started Matrix Men and I started telling my story in the hope. And so many men are afraid to come in and, 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 and talk about that. But the freedom that you gain when you start dealing with it is amazing. You know, it's, it's, it's something that you can't put a monetary value to. You know, it's just no way to explain how it is to go from being suicidal and depressed most of your life to be happy and confident and able 
you know, that, that to me was the journey in a nutshell. Yeah. Sure. Final take, Doc. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, mean I, I think Martin, like, explained it, like, very well. Because for me, healing, it is, it is when one is able to speak about the unspoken. Like when, when, when a person is like, you know, something that I was like, you know, keeping to myself and freely now I'm able to talk about it. And then I become free of this burden, free of this stress, free of this like, you no know, depression. And, but the other thing that I need to caution is that it doesn't like, you know, end, you know, to say. It's, no, it's, it's an ongoing it's, process. It's, it's, it's ongoing yeah. and ongoing Definitely. and ongoing. And I think that's what we need to sort of like, emphasize. Mm -hmm. But once we've done the, the, the dirty, dirty work of like starting, the, the later phases, the hence even the frequency, it's like you know, once in a while. I mean, the clients that I see twice a year, thrice a year. And at the beginning, it was like you know, weekly and weekly and weekly and weekly. And we touch base, like uh, all is still well. You know, I'm dealing with this, but it's not a major, major, like, you know, um, like no stress. Martin, as far as the exercise of seeking therapy is concerned, I'd like to talk, and I think you'd be best positioned to answer this being that you are a white man or, or someone who identifies as a white man. <laughs> this idea that therapy is for white people, that seems to emerge as, a, a, as an answer whenever, whenever black men are confronted with mm. the need to to access therapy, they go, oh no, but that's a white people thing. Is yes. there any insight you can give to us as far as the the racial demographic that is apparently at play in terms of which of the of the race divide accesses this chooses to access therapy between white men and black men, and how do we go about addressing the discrepancies if there are any to address? Yeah, uh, definitely there is a racial thing, so a cultural problem. Let's call it that, right? So I find the most people that come in. For support are Afrikaans males, oh. believe it or not. And I kind of thinking about it, I can only hypothesize is that um, Afrikaans have kind of ruled the roost for so many years and all of a sudden they were shown to be wrong in every aspect of their belief, I think. And that I think the most willing to change, you know, the most willing to, to evolve, right? Um, the next would be English white guys um, and then yeah, strangely enough, black people uh, would be the next sort of major proportion of our members. Um, Coloreds, zero. Indians, a few. So if you're going to take the worst uh, in terms of race, the colored people are the ones that don't want to talk about this. Yeah. The next would be Indians and then blacks, you know, English, Afri uh, English Afrikaans, we can even break it down to so not just a white black thing. And yeah, I think a lot of it is a cultural aspect when talking to colored people and asking them why they don't want to come through and help. And they say, because the communities are so small that if you do go for therapy, somebody will find out about it and then the, you know, the, the, whole, the whole community will know about it and you'll be mocked for it. Mm. So they're afraid to come in terms of that aspect. Um, the Indian community, again, you know, quite a small community uh, you know, and, and you'd be deemed to be weak. If, if, if you had to come in for therapy and that sort of thing. But, you know, men in general, we, we're not given permission to to seek help, right. you know. Right. And one of our drives was to make it woke for men to come for therapy, you know. We opened a centre where we could have, uh, we offered free support to men. Um, our numbers in eight months escalated hugely. You know, we, we used to on average have three, four new men into the groups and the sessions uh, every month. In eight months, we got another 73 men in uh, to come for help. And that was purely through social media, but we had to close down, unfortunately, because we we're willing to spend 11 billion rand a year on fixing broken women, but not a cent on fixing broken men. And that's very sad. You know, so the center's closed. So we're drawing back, we're seeking funding, and hopefully we'll be able to open those spaces that you were talking about in every major city. And when I say major city, I'm talking Soweto, I'm talking Johannesburg, I'm talking Alexander, I'm talking Timbisa, I'm talking, you know, uh, around the country. We, we want to create those safe spaces where, like a man cave, where men can come in and talk about the issues, not, you know, instead of the Shabin, let's go to this space. And, 
and seek that therapy. You know, it doesn't have to be that blatant. It just needs to be 10 people talking about the issues that they suffer. When, you know, my wife is beating me and you're not going to get laughed at because you're in the Shabin. You know, people are actually going to empathize with you and say, I understand, you know, how can we help you? Um, those are the sorts of spaces that we need to, need to create. Sure. Mm. Absolutely. And hopefully this is the beginning of some kind of journey too. Thank you so much for coming through and I guess giving of yourself in such a generous way. Martin and Melos, I really do appreciate it. Look, we were never going to solve all the problems around what it means to be a man in this context, especially when you consider, you know, things that aren't necessarily spoken about in this way. But as I always say, we've started the conversation. Hopefully you'll be able to take it forward. Thanks for watching and listening.